Hi everyone, my name is Anton Ali and this presentation is on a bit of research I did entitled A Swash Zone Seaward Boundary Condition for Impermeable Beaches. This is a pre-recorded presentation, therefore any concerns, questions, comments could be forwarded to the email address anton underscore 1991 at live.com. So the presentation will follow this layout where I'll give an introduction of what exactly is the swash zone, why is it important, and why is there a need for a boundary condition for this zone. I'll give the objective and the assumptions associated with this research, the methodology as to how the research was carried out. I'll also give some characteristic results and analysis, and finally, the conclusions of the research. <coughs> So before I get into the details of research, I need to outline what exactly is the source zone. Well, it is nothing more than a subzone of the coastal region, which is located at the boundary between the land and the sea. More specifically, it is the region of the beach which is bounded between the maximum run-up and run-down limits of waves. A more easily recognized definition is that it is the region of the beach which is periodically exposed to the atmosphere due to the oscillations of the sea at the centerpiece. And this image shows what the zone looks like in a real life setting. But why is the zone important and why numerically model the zone? Well, the zone is important for three main aspects. Firstly, by its mere definition, where it outlines the maximum run of location we see, and this is critical when deciding setbacks for coastal structure designs. Secondly, an important aspect of littoral drift occurs within this wash zone, and hence, the zone is important as it regards to longshore sediment transport. Thirdly, and probably the most important, is that this wash zone possesses the highest sediment budget as compared to any other region of the coastal zone. As a result of this high sediment budget, this wash zone also possesses the highest sediment transport rate as compared to any other region of the coastal zone. It is because of these three main aspects that it is critical to better understand the source zone. But why pursue this via a numerical modeling approach? Well, there are challenges associated with a field approach. More specifically, there are limitations of equipment as it regards to the current state of the art. In addition, and in the field, the source zone is transient, complex, and highly variable with regards to both time and space. These make it excessively challenging to conduct research via this approach. Various laboratory experiments may address such concerns via imposing control environment. It is generally limited in its scope. Therefore, it is for these reasons that an alternative numerical modeling approach appears attractive. Now, there is still one major issue with a numerical approach. And for me to explain it, I would have to briefly highlight how the numerical modeling is done. In essence, the numerical modeling of the zone falls under the realm of computational fluid dynamics. And this entails solving the Navier Stokes equations, which are shown here. Now, the drawback of solving these equations is that they are computationally demanding and require a significant amount of simulation time. Now, keeping this in mind and returning back to numerically modeling this work soon, it is required that any numerical source zone analysis to not only solve these navier Stokes equations within the source region, but also solve them for the offshore. And the reason for this is that the influence of the offshore waves that produces the source zone fields must be included. In fact, numerical modeling of modeling the source zone would be relevant without these driving waves offshore. And therefore, the obvious issue is this: that all of the source zone region may be relatively small, a numerical approach requires that the modeling area be increased. And this is the major drawback, since this directly corresponds to increased computational costs. The research at hand is geared towards this specific area of reducing this computational cost. And this is done by the objective of research which is to develop a driving seaward boundary condition for the source zone. This boundary condition would incorporate the influence of the offshore waves and hence omit the need for solving the Navier slopes beyond the zone. 
This bound condition is shown by the pink line and as is seen, it drastically reduces the domain size and hence the computational cost. <coughs> A few assumptions were made in research and they are as follows, that the still water line is the seaward limit of the source zone and thus the location for which the boundary condition is being applied. Secondly, that the source flows are due to regular and periodic waves and therefore the source zone boundary condition being developed is limited to regular and periodic waves. And finally, that all of the waves are non-breaking and if it is to do break, they break seaward of that still water line position. Now, the method used to develop the boundary condition was basically via a series of laboratory experiments within the coastal engineering flume located in the Department of Civil Engineering at the St. Augustine campus of the University of the West Indies. Uh, the image of the flume is shown in the, in the diagram here. Essentially, the experiments measured the temporal velocities and water depths at the sort of water line for the varying beach slopes and reef conditions within the flume. To give a bit more detail, the experiments were set up as shown in the diagram where a wave generator is located at one end of the flume and the, the impermeable beach slope at the other end. In between, six wave gauges were deployed as shown in the diagram and a video observation zone was located at the impermeable beach slope end. The experimental procedure was basically to generate a series of waves from the generator and record the wave gauge readings as well as visual observations of the runoff and the rundown on the slope. This was done for 15 wave conditions across 5 wave slopes, amounting to 75 conditions. So to give an example of what the video observation results look like, here we see the progressive runoff and the rundown of the swatch lens, and these are the basic results used to yield the time-bearing velocities as well as time-bearing swatch depth heights. The exact formula used to decompose this observation into the velocities and swatch heights are omitted here because they are a bit lengthy. Instead, references made to the attached people. So what does the process itself look like? Well, here is an example of the water height duration or time for, for the 25 degrees peak slope for offshore waves of 0 0.01 meter across five different frequencies. As you see, they all have the same general shape. And this the shape can be represented by any number of mathematical relationships. And here is an example of the process velocity results, again for the 25 degree slope and for an offshore wave amplitude of 0 0.01 meters at the same frequencies. It is observed that these results are plotted with velocity against water height, and they all show an elliptical fit for both the uprush and backwash phases of the swash. Now, all the results for both the velocity and the water heights show these same trends and therefore they are consistent over all of the 75 conditions conducted in the experiment. The analysis of these processed results was essentially to formalize a generic empirical fit for both the water heights and the velocities over all of the 75 conditions and this would produce the boundary condition. For the water height, this was found to be a signed fit with coefficients A1, B2 and C3. And these coefficients are computed by the relevant equations as shown. It should also be noted that they all depend upon the frequency and the heights of the wave offshore as well as the relevant beach slope. A similar analysis for the velocity results of light and elliptical fit where the primary and secondary axes are given by E and B. These values are computed by different formula between the upper and backwash phases as can be seen However, this still ultimately depend upon the frequency and height of the waves offshore as well as the beach slope. So in conclusion, it can be stated that an experimentally derived seaward boundary condition was developed for the swatch zone, which is to be applied at the still water line location. And it describes the water height variation with time as well as the velocity variations with time as given by a sign fit and elliptical fit respectively. And here are some of the references used in this research. And this concludes my presentation. Any questions or comments, again, can be forwarded to my email address, Anton underscore 1991 at live.com. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anisha Goganeni.
Before um, Anisha um, does her presentation, um, I believe Dr. Lam is still with us. Yes, I'm here. This is Aparna. Sorry, Aparna, just a minute. Um, is Dr. Lam still with us? Um, yes, I am. Okay. Um, so as if there are any specific or general questions that members may want to ask, um, Dr. Lam will um, get the answers first. Um, so Dr. Leon, any questions on the chat? Yes, I have one question there. Can the methodology account for obstacles in this was Um, I'm um, morning again. I'm not too sure about the question, but um, the Swashul itself is landward of the point in which Anton is trying to get the seaward boundary condition. So the idea was to get a way to connect the velocities and the water levels at that most seaward limit of the swash zone and tie it or link it to the offshore wave conditions so he doesn't have to do the modeling across the entire nearshore zone. That seaward boundary condition will then be input into his model. He's using a sort of mark and cell approach to track the water profile into the bed in the swash zone. So it will really account just for the infiltration into the bed and the terminal, the extent of the run up in the swash zone itself. So I don't know if that has answered the question. Yes, um, to answer the question. Um, I have one question, um, just the, the title um, said um, impermeable beach. Um, is a beach really impermeable? No, the beach is not <laughs> impermeable. Um, thank you for that. But what we are looking at is he's looking to get the absolute magnitude of the, the highest velocities of the seaward limit. And what he will be modeling is the permeability of the bed. So at that boundary condition, we, he just wanted to capture what the velocities and water levels would be before they begin to infiltrate into the bed. So that was what that was an attempt to do. And that would feed into his model, which will then take into account the infiltration in the bed, which is again, a permeable bed. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Thompson, that's it there, no more yeah, questions. Well, I have, I have two oh, questions oh. for Dr. Lam. <laughs> um, first question, Dr. Lam. Um, how, how important has it been for this research to have that, um, that piece of equipment that we have generated at WaveFlow? Okay. Um, well, it was important part of his research. We tried to preempt it before we had this boom built locally. He had gone to UCL in London to execute some of his lab work. So it was always a critical part of the work. Um, the foam being built here gave, of course, greater accessibility to conduct and execute research um, rather than having to fly across to UCL to do that. So um, he has used it to do the testing on the final stages here uh, as he completed his model. Um, one of the limitations we had while he was doing this research was um, I had no way to capture the values of the velocity. So Anton had to find a way to estimate what that velocity is. So we had procured a piece of equipment um, earlier in the year, um, and I'm hoping that he still has time to just confirm his results um, with the ADV that we're supposed to be getting um, in terms of velocity so that he can just fine tune his, his equations if he needs to um, before he submits. But it is a critical aspect of his research. And um, basically, would you say that therefore with the wave flume and that piece of equipment, it makes our lab one of the premier labs in this part of the region for coastal um, <laughs> research? Yes, Dr. Townsend, yes, Chair, I would say so. It puts us in a position where we can do work that is comparable to work that has been done at um, top tier universities outside of the region. So yes, it does place us in a position where we can execute our cutting edge research here locally. Excellent, so you're talking about world-class research and how important is coastal research in terms of this era of global warming and all these issues? Oh, well, of course, you know, it's topical um, area because of course with the issue of climate change, we have um, significant changes taking place in our coastal zone and for us in the Caribbean region, you have that, that concentration of, um, of assets and, and assets at risk in the coastal region. So it's a critical aspect for us here regionally and anywhere in the world that has that concentration um, of people and, and economic investment in their coastal zones. 
We're talking about relevant and cutting edge research. Thank you very much.